This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. We know that all scripture is given by inspiration, and some of that inspiration is tongue-in-cheek. Not everything in the Bible can or should be taken literally. So how do we properly interpret it? Michael Rood walks us through some examples in the Bible tonight so that we may rightly divide the truth. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live! Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Is Yeshua a thief? Well, of course he's not. The Bible says he'll come back like a thief in the night. Obviously, that's not the way we need to interpret that. So how are we supposed to interpret things like this in the Bible? Well, Michael Rood explains tonight in the fourth episode of Rightly Dividing the Truth. But right now, please welcome my co-host, the Chief Operating Officer of Rood Awakening International, Ted Clayton. Well, Shabbat Shalom, Scott. I am so glad to be here. And hello, Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shabbat Night Live. Now, tonight's episode, Ted, is called It's Just a Figure of Speech. So here's what we'll see tonight from Michael Root. The traditions that we now have, sometimes people only know the traditions and they have no idea what we are supposed to be remembering. When they say next year in Jerusalem, they think, hey, next year in Jerusalem, we're gonna, we're gonna do the, the, the cups of wine, we're gonna do things like we did in the, in the Galut, in the diaspora. No, it's just looking for that day that the temple will be rebuilt. And I know who's gonna rebuild that temple. And I know who's gonna reign there for a thousand years. And I know who's gonna go up to the Feast of Tabernacles every year to worship the king, Yehovah Tzavot. I am gonna be there. And if you wanna be there, then you better listen to what Yeshua has to say. But he says, most who call me Lord are not gonna be there. They're gonna completely miss it because they've grown up anomia without the Torah in complete contradiction of the Torah, and he will not have it. Only those who do the Father's will will enter the kingdom, not those who just call him Lord and get their Gospel of John and a pat on the bottom. It's not gonna cut it. He is the one, the king from heaven, laid down the rules of the kingdom, and that's what the Gospel of Matthew is all about. The king from heaven laying down the rules of the kingdom whereby you will either be admitted or rejected, and you better listen to him. If you don't shema, hear and obey him, there is absolutely no hope, no hope whatsoever. So there we go. So you can't always take things literally, and that's exactly what Michael's trying to get across here, is that yes. you know there are figures of speech, there are idioms, little things they said in Hebrew culture, and we kind of need to understand those things in order to understand the Bible. The one thing I love about Michael Rood and how he teaches the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, is he teaches the Bible in such a way that it helps you understand the things necessary to get through another week in life. And I just love that about Michael's teachings and, and what he does. This is just another prime example of how Michael understands the Bible in ways other people just simply don't. Indeed, now this is the end of the uh, the April month on the Gregorian, yes, calendar. On the Gregorian calendar. So uh, we yeah. still have several more episodes of this series coming up. We're actually right smack dab in, in the middle, the middle. Of it. Yeah, yeah, There's, there's right. a lot that's more right. to come. But it is the last day for this love gift we've been talking about. And I think you know the, the silver set is a wonderful thing and the teaching is a wonderful thing, but I think this is the piece de resistance right That's here. right. This is the, the, the garden uh, flag with Ye the name of Yehovah on it. And you've mentioned, or we've mentioned, and you maybe you've heard this in the last couple of weeks where we've talked about that this is only one of several flags that we're gonna be offering for Root Awakening International. Uh, we already had a Passover one, uh, Shavuot one's coming up, we've got this one. So get your collection started. Well, <laughs> here, here's how it all started. You know, Michael was thinking, you know, we've got a flag for the beginning of spring. We have a flag Beautiful. for winter. We have a flag for the other holidays. Why not have a flag for the Almighty's feasts? 
And so we started out with the name of God because obviously everything revolves around the name mm -hmm. of God. And then we started uh, developing the other yard flags like the Passover flag, yes. the Shavuot flag, and all of these uh, other flags. Ladies and gentlemen, get these flags, display them proudly in your yard and know that these are great conversation starters. Your neighbors are gonna say, where in the world did you get that beautiful yard flag? And you can explain exactly where you got it. Yep, it was a gift from Michael. That's really right. what it was. That's really when true. you give to this ministry $50 uh, during the month of, month of April, today again being the last day, yes. uh, Finding God's Gold, this is a teaching from Kevin Fisher about the gold of the Ark of the Covenant being exactly where we say, where, uh, Ron White says it, it was. was. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, that there is new de gold detection equipment used to find it and prove it on video. It's pretty cool. It's a fantastic video, and it really explained things in a way that have never been explained before. It's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. So now that is a gift for $50 or more. Uh, the flag comes with a gift of $100. $100 and you get more. everything here, including the serving set for a gift of $300. And you know, once again, Scott, we, we haven't really highlighted the silver serving set, but ladies and gentlemen, this is not some cheap knockoff thing. This is absolutely oh, beautiful. beautiful. It has weight, yep. it has uh, real it's, resilience. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's and it's great to put anything you'd want to serve. And once again, a great uh, conversation starter because your neighbors, your friends, your family, they'll say, where in the world did you get this beautiful serving set? And you can say, it was given to me by Michael Rood. That's right. Now on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar, we are right in the middle of the month of ER and you look at that month uh, on, the, on your new calendar and you might say, well, we're on the uh, 28th day of the Omer and uh, yeah. there's not much else going on in the middle of that month, but actually there was a whole lot going on. We just don't know much about it, but something we do know is uh, this, this is the time period, first of all, when Yeshua was crucified, rose again, and now this is the 40 days before he ascended. Right. And there was lots going on. He was appearing to people here and there, still doing things. And one of the uh, things we always hear about is when he uh, showed up uh, on the lake, yes. told yes. the fishermen to come ashore, bring yes. some fish, and uh, he basically had a shore, uh, a shore lunch with them. That's right, a little fireside chat, yep. as it were. Indeed, and so he, uh, they broiled some fish and he ate it and they went, wow, it really is him. And so, and this is when he and uh, Kepha, or better known as Peter, Peter. had yeah. a very interesting conversation. And you, you hear this conversation and the way Michael explains it's really good because uh, you really get to see how Peter's feelings were kind of hurt. Mm -hmm. yeah. That Yeshua was saying, do you love me? Remember that whole story? So let me give you a different perspective on this story. And again, this is all about rightly dividing the truth. And Michael does a brilliant job here. This is on page 273 if you have the chronological gospels. So he says, Yeshua asked Kepha uh, after Kenepha, uh, Kepha denied him three times and then uh, went back to the fishing industry. Yeshua said, do you agape me? Mm -hmm. Do you love me? So this right. is using the Greek. Right. Uh, do you love me with a divine love? And Kepha could not bring himself to confess such undying selfless love after disappointing Yeshua and, and by saying, I will never ever forsake you. And then of course he denied him. Denied times, right? Times, yeah. So Kepha replied, I phileo you. This is a different word in the Greek, which yes. means I love you like a friend. Friend, yes. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he basically says, that's all I can offer you right now. He was so embarrassed that he said, yeah, I love you, but I love you as a friend. I don't have that undying love. Obviously, I don't. I deny you three times, and he's just feeling like trash. Yes, And yes. so again, Yeshua asks, do you agape me? And Kepha still insists he can only be a friend. Uh, Yeshua invites him to feed the mature crop. Uh, crop, mature sheep. <laughs> <laughs> and then Yeshua backs down uh, the intensity and asks Kepha, okay, fine, do you phileo me? Do you love me as a friend? And Kepha responds, you know my heart, you see right through me. You know my faults and how weak I really am. These are Michael's interpretations sure, sure, of what exactly, you know, exactly. Peter's saying. And you know that I really do love you as a friend. And then Yeshua, even though Yeshua didn't get that initial reaction from him, he still says, he still invites him to come back and feed the flock. That's right. So. Yeshua knows our weaknesses and still he says, I don't care. I right. still want you to follow me. I still want you to be my servant. Absolutely. You're good enough. Don't think that you're not good enough. And that's a message we can take to heart today. Amen. You know, we, we, we're good enough. Yeshua knows our weaknesses. He yes. created us. Absolutely. We're good enough and we just need to be okay with that and just still follow him regardless of what we think of ourselves. That's right, Scott. And ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't gotten your Chronological Gospels Bible, now is the time to do it because you can look at these passages and with Michael's subtitle, 
context there, you can get an entirely different understanding of something that you thought you really understood, but after Michael yep. explains it in such a wonderful way, you really get the message in a different light. Absolutely. Okay, thanks very much, Ted. Thank you. All right, not everything in the Bible can or should be taken literally, so how do we properly interpret the Bible? Michael Rood walks us through some examples in the Bible tonight in episode four of Rightly Dividing the Truth. Now the kiddish is next, so stay with us. In the 1980s, Ron Wyatt claimed to have found the Ark of the Covenant. Today, sophisticated gold detection equipment is suggesting his claim is true. So now it's spinning when it's, it's moving left and right, scanning, and it's pointing to the cross hole, which the Ark of the Covenant would be below that. Yes. So it's underneath that area right there. So the Ark is below. Finding God's Gold with special guest Kevin Fisher reveals amazing video that connects Golgotha to the Ark of the Covenant. But the only way to watch it is to receive it as our gift. Donate a $50 love gift and we'll send you Finding God's Gold with Kevin Fisher on DVD or Blu-ray. Or for a donation of $100, we'll send you Finding God's Gold plus a one-of-a-kind yard flag featuring the name of Yahovah in Hebrew, scanned directly from the Aleppo Codex. Or as a special offer for a donation of $300, we'll send you Finding God's Gold with Kevin Fisher, the Name of God yard flag, and a silver-plated serving set, perfect for adding some set-apart elegance to make the Sabbath extra special. These gifts are available only in April, and supplies are limited. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Remember, this offer ends April 30th and supplies are limited. Call now to receive your gifts, 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610 or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. There is a rabbinic tradition, even a takanot, a law which changed biblical law, that before one eats bread, one must wash their hand with the two-handled pot, a nagel vessel, and say this prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments, commanding us to wash the hands. Nowhere in the scripture is this ever commanded. In fact, the rabbis will plainly say that we are the ones that made it up, and when you are obeying us, you're obeying God. Well, Yeshua said, do not follow the talking of the Pharisees. Do not follow their man-made rules and regulations. But every time there is bread, every time we can remember what Yeshua said, what he put in place, and we can say the prayer, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And Yeshua said, I am the bread brought forth in the earth. This represents my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do this, if it's every meal, if it's every Sabbath, you do it in remembrance of me. 
because by his stripes we were healed. And Yeshua took the cup and he said, Baruch atah Yehovah, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, Borei pari hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, king of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua said, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood, the broken covenant in which we were offered to be priests and kings. Yeshua paid the price. He renewed the covenant with us and made us priests and kings. And so as often as we do this, we remember this and we reign as priests and kings now and will do so in the future with Yeshua for a thousand years in our resurrected body along with his resurrected body. We do this in remembrance of him. In E.W. Bullinger's 1898 work on figure speech, he gives names to 217 different figures of speech that are used in the Bible, and the figures of speech metaphor and simile are really the most used in the scripture, and that's what we're going to be dealing with next. Not condescensio, but as a metaphors and simile, and I'm asking you now to turn to 2 Peter, Chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3. And in verse 10, we begin reading. But the day of the Lord, and you'll notice that here it is all lowercase, L-O-R-D. Here is where we have a problem. Because in the Brit Hadashah, we do not have the name, except in the Hebrew Matthew, we do not have yod heh vav heh. We have from the Greek, uh, we have kurios, uh, which is master. We have theos, which is God. And it is translated one way or the other, but unless we have the quote from the Torah or know by context, we don't know what it should be, except in this case, uh, this is very clear. But the day of Yehovah will come as a thief in the night. As a thief in the night. Now, uh, so you could go in, and this is why I suggest that you have a, a wide margin version of the scripture so that you can go in there and you can make the notation on this because this should be yod heh vav Either put it in Hebrew characters or make it capital L-O, capital R, and capital D, all capitals, as the protocol is in your 1611 King James Version of the Bible. And so when you go through the Gospels and through Shaul's letters, then you can correct it to what it should have been if they would have recognized and put the name in, in that particular place. Uh, so speaking of the day, the Himera of Yehovah, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now here, when we have the term used as, we have a simile, the figure speech is simile. It's showing a comparison as how a thief in the night comes to how the day of the Lord comes. He comes as a thief in the night. It doesn't say that he is a thief in the night. If it says that the Lord is a thief in the night, that would be a metaphor. Exchanging one thing for another that are unrelated, but there are similarities that can be drawn. So simile and metaphor are very close. But in this case, this is a simile showing similarities as a thief in the night. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. Now this is not talking about the initial, initial day of the Lord when Yeshua comes back and reigns upon the earth. This is what's speaking about at the end of the book of Revelation, after the last resurrection and everyone is judged, that is when death and hell are cast into the lake of fire and destroyed, and there's a new heaven and a new earth. So that's when the heavens and the earth is gonna pass away with the great noise and the elements melt away with the fervent heat. So again, you have to take a look at the day of the Lord. It's not a day, it's Hamera. It is a time period. It is a time period in which Yehovah does the judging, but that will come upon us as a thief in the night. 
And so as a thief in the night, we have to ask, what does that mean? And so we can go into its previous usages uh, and see this very thing. Now, to establish what day or Himera is, you know, such as the day of the Lord, we are going to take a look at Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. 1 Corinthians Chapter four, verse three, it says, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. The word judgment is himera, it's day. It's a small thing that I should be judged by you or by man's judgment or uh, a man's day because this is a period of time in which man does the judging, and judgment has been relegated to man in order to maintain order on the earth. The Almighty is not judging man right now. If he was, there's not too many of us that would still be drawing breath, okay? But he is one who has relegated judgment to man. That's why I said in one of our earlier sessions, he says, thou shall not kill. And then uh, murder, literally. Thou shalt not murder is what it says in Hebrew. And then it goes on to tell us that if someone murders someone intentionally, that that person is be put to death by man. It's not up to God to do this. It's up to man to maintain order, and this is what the Almighty has relegated to us. So, you know, those who say, well, the Bible says thou shalt not kill, and so capital punishment is wrong. That's what you get when you isolate one word in English and you have no idea what you're talking about. This is what the Bible calls idios epilusos. Idios or one's own letting loose, or the letting loose of an idios or which translated as idiot, okay? You just don't make it up, you just don't let your mind go free, get things in context. This is a day of man's judgment and that's why man's day is then translating King James as man's judgment, to be judge of man's judgment. So we see in Exodus uh, yeah, th this very thing, he that smites a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Now, I want you to look at Job 24. Job 24 and in verse 14. Job 24, 14. The murderer, rising up with the light, kills the poor and needy, and in the night is as a thief. Okay, so, okay, so if, if the Lord, day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, so can we just look at the scripture and say, okay, the murderer rises up and kills the poor and needy, and in the night is as a thief. So what does a thief in the night do? According to the Bible, he kills the poor and needy. Okay, is this what is being communicated by the scripture? That the Lord is coming and he's gonna kill the poor and needy. Well, see, if we simply take the same words and go back to different parts of the Bible, we can construct just about any ridiculous notion that we want to. But let's take a look in 1 Thessalonians and see if we can put it in context with the culture, the land, the language, the people of Israel who have grown up with the Torah their whole lives. And this is a great key, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, the written oracles and the living oracles of God were committed to Israel. They were the ones that protected the, the scripture. And there are many people that think that if the Jews do it, it's got to be wrong. Well, remember, as Shaul said, of all the advantages there are to being raised in the, the Jewish culture in Israel, knowing the Torah from her youth, the greatest thing is that the living oracles of God were committed to them, and that one day the Gentiles will come to Israel from the ends of the earth, cry out in repentance for the abominations, the ridiculous religions they inherited, and the Almighty is gonna make known his hand, his might, and his power, and that even the Gentiles will learn from the Jews that his name is Yehovah, they will call upon him, they will be saved, they will be able to praise the name of Yehovah instead of just a, you know, the Lord. As a matter of fact, in Hebrew, the Lord is Baal. When Elijah went up against the prophets of Baal, he says, let's see who is, uh, who is God. Is it Baal, the Lord, or is it Yehovah? 
Yehovah is the name. Baal uh, is a Hebrew, Baali is husband. Baal is just Lord, master, husband, okay? Indistinct title, indistinct commandments, it's whatever you want him to be. Baal is whatever Lord you want to concoct. You want to put a hat on him and a cherry red suit. You want to put a a blazing cross. You want to put long hair on him and blue eyes. That You you want that kind of God. You want the eight pound, six ounce baby Jesus or or the 10 pound, 14 ounce baby Jesus. It's like, you know, just make up your own thing. That's what has happened out there. Now, let's look, 1 Thessalonians chapter five. We begin reading in verse one, right at the very beginning of the chapter. Oh, gotta get there myself. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Now, this same phrase that it uses, times and seasons, the reckoning of the, the motion of the heavenly bodies is what determines, as it says in Revela- uh, excuse me, in Genesis, they're put there for times and seasons, a common biblical phrase. And the time, the, the passage of time is marked out by the movement of the heavenly bodies. And the seasons are the Moedim, they are the feast of the Lord. And this is what it's going to be talking about, about the day of the Lord coming. And of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves perfectly know that the day of the Lord, and here it should be all caps, the day of Yehovah, so comes as a thief in the night. Now in Job we find out that a thief in the night comes and kills the innocent, the poor and the needy. This is not what it's trying to communicate. It has to be interpreted very carefully. The word as is a simile. The word is is a metaphor. Figures of speech must be interpreted very conservatively in order to prevent error. A metaphor is a figure of speech which makes a comparison between two things that are unrelated but share a single characteristic or some common characteristics. And that's why you have to be very careful because you just can't say that, well, this means this and this means that. There may be only one single characteristic that is common or there may be several. We'll take a look at one of these figures of speech and see what it, what it says. Now we're gonna go back, for when they, for when they, now well, first of all, let, let, me, let me go back. The day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So how does a thief in the night come? Well, he comes in, he pries open the window on the far end of the house, he comes in with a crowbar and sneaks into your bedroom and beats you with it, and then takes your car keys your television, your stereo, loads it up in your car and drives off. Is that what it's trying to communicate here? No, that is not what the figure of speech, this simile is attempting to communicate. The day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. It was 20 years ago that I began teaching this, and it was long before, it was a decade before, the Carta Illustrated Encyclopedia of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem before this came out. And this came out because of the work of the Temple Treasures Institute and accessing the the information that the Kohanim, the priest in Israel, had been passing down from generation to generation for literally for thousands of years. Because if your last name is Cohen, then you are Kohanim. You are of the offspring of Aaron, and that is something that has not been lost. For the most part, the Kohanim in Israel, uh, Miro Cohen, uh, for instance, is a friend of mine. Uh, I used to sit in his sheepfold out in Tekoa, Israel, day after day, asking him questions about the temple service, about these prophetic shadow pictures embedded in the temple service. Now, this is extremely important to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that the traditions that we now have in modern day Judaism are not what we did in the temple. 
What we did in the temple is gone. The Levitical priesthood is in disarray. The temple's been destroyed. We have not done what we've done in the temple since the temple was destroyed in 68 of the Common Era according to accurate Jewish reckoning, exactly 40 years after Yeshua's crucifixion. Exactly. Now, what was then put in place are remembrances of what we used to do in the temple. And at the end of the Passover Seder, this is what we say at the end of the Passover Seder every time we say next year in Jerusalem. Now, not that we're gonna do this Passover Seder, which is not what we did in the temple, but this remembrance, we're, we're not saying we're gonna do that next year. It's the hope that one day that there would be a temple, we would be able to do Passover, and when we do it, this next time, it's gonna be recognition that Yeshua is the Passover lamb who is sacrificed for us. It's gonna be with full knowledge and understanding that all these rehearsals put in place, that David put in place, that were put also in place when we before we came out of Egypt concerning Passover, that they are all prophetic shadow pictures that the Messiah must and will fulfill, and he fulfilled it to the very day, the very hour, the exact moment, and every detail in which we rehearsed them for a thousand years. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, the Gospels, the Gospels, Matthew, first four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the detail of Yeshua fulfilling the spring feast of the Lord, just as we rehearsed them in the temple service for a thousand years. The fifth gospel, the book of the Revelation, is the detail of how the Messiah will fulfill the fall feast of the Lord. But if we are raised in a Western Gentile culture in which basically everything we inherited came right out of Babylonian sun worship through Rome and mixed in with pagan sun worship there and the worship of Mithra, who... Constantine worshiped till the day of his death. Mithra was born on December 25th, the time of the winter solstice on the ancient Babylonian calendar before the procession of the equinoxes. Yes, all this came right straight out of pagan sun god worship. And if we've grown up in that culture, when we read the gospels, we have no idea what we're reading. We do not realize that Yeshua is literally fulfilling the spring feast of the Lord. And this is what he detailed to his disciples on the road to Emmaus when he opened their understanding, their hearts burned within them because they finally understood from Genesis all the way through, they saw the Messiah and all these shadow pictures because they related to him everything that they saw that last week. And he said, ought not Messiah to have fulfilled all these things that you've just enumerated mile after mile as we walked out from Jerusalem to Emmaus? I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when you understand the feast of the Lord, I've taken 13 hours in video format to lay this out to you, you will understand the gospels like you never have imagined them before because the rivers of understanding will flow together. Yeshua fulfilled the spring feast. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, he will fulfill the fall feast, the book of the Revelation. And so now we see these things that are done in Judaism today are remembrances of what we did in the temple, but they're not what we did in the temple. What we did in the temple are the prophetic shadow pictures. The traditions that we now have, sometimes people only know the traditions and they have no idea what we are supposed to be remembering. When they say next year in Jerusalem, they think, hey, next year in Jerusalem, we're gonna, we're gonna do the, the, the cups of wine, we're gonna do things like we did in the, in the Galut, in the diaspora. No, it's just looking for that day that the temple will be rebuilt. And I know who's gonna rebuild that temple. And I know who's gonna reign there for a thousand years. And I know who's gonna go up to the Feast of Tabernacles every year to worship the king, Yehovah Tzavot. I am gonna be there. And if you wanna be there, then you better listen to what Yeshua has to say, because he says, most who call me Lord are not gonna be there. They're gonna completely miss it because they've grown up anomia without the Torah in complete contradiction to the Torah, and he will not have it. Only those who do the Father's will will enter the kingdom, not those who just call him Lord and get their Gospel of John and a pat on the bottom. It's not gonna cut it. He is the one, the king from heaven, laid down the rules of the kingdom, and that's what the Gospel of Matthew is all about. The king from heaven laying down the rules of the kingdom whereby you will either be admitted or rejected, and you better listen to him. If you don't shema, hear and obey him, there is absolutely no hope 
no hope whatsoever. So, but at the times of seasons, you have no need to write unto you, for you know perfectly that the day of Yahweh so comes as a thief in the night. Why? Because the Torah tells us he's coming as a thief in the night. Now, what does this thief in the night mean? I have the illustration on, on canvas of that which is in the Carta Encyclopedia of the Temple Treasures, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. And this is what is uh, just over my shoulder here. And this is something that transpires on the Temple Mount. And I was teaching this again 20 years ago. People said, are you just making this up? No, this comes from being in the land of Israel, living there and making myself available to go out and live in the sheep caves of Tekoa for weeks at a time and to spend the time with the Kohanim out there to get the background on it. Because during, while the temple stood, it was the duty of a priest to tend the fires at the altar, at the brazen altar. And during the night, he was to keep it not roaring with fire, but just keep the fire going enough so that in the morning they could stoke it up. And at the time of the morning sacrifice, they could stoke it up. That's when they sacrificed a lamb, they took the blood and they poured it out in the earth because this is not a blood atonement, it's not a blood sacrifice. They literally take the blood and they pour it out in the earth to show this is not an atonement of any type. It's not a sin offering. They take that entire lamb and then they put it on that raging fire and the entire lamb is incinerated and that that fragrance of that lamb being incinerated goes up to heaven, and this is a recognition that God is the owner of the heavens and the earth because he created it. At the evening sacrifice, the same thing is done, but is a recognition that God is the owner of the heavens and the earth because he has redeemed it. The morning and the evening oblations, this is what Daniel speaks of, that will be ceased. There will be 2,300 evenings and mornings sacrifices that will be discontinued in the last days by the Antimessiah, and it takes exactly 1,150 days to accomplish 2,300 evening and morning oblations. And Daniel was not given the code to how to de decipher this, because there were two feasts that were yet to be put in place. Hanukkah, which is a picture of Antiochus Epiphanes as the Antichrist, the Antimessiah, and Purim, which is the picture of Haman as the Antimessiah. With both of those put in place, now you have the 1,150 days, you have the 2,300 evening and morning sacrifices, you have all of those things resident within the scriptures so that we can understand how that will be fulfilled in the last days. But here, here is what transpires on the Temple Mount. The priest is supposed to take care of the fire, but he gets it going. If he gets that fire going, then he goes and lays down, covers up, and takes a little nap. Many times the high priest will then come up onto the Temple Mount with his entourage in the middle of the night to inspect the Temple Guard. If he finds the Temple Guard asleep, he will then, as he sneaks up on the Temple Mount as a thief in the night and finds the Temple Guard, one supposed to be taking care of the fire, asleep, he will then take his torch and he will light the garment of the priest on duty. Then as that priest is just being gently warmed by the fire of his garments, and then all of a sudden, awakening to his garments being on fire, tears them off and fleeing naked and wounded from the Temple Mount. This is the high priest acting as a thief in the night because this priest was supposed to have his eyes open. He was supposed to be on duty. That's why the next verse saying that you know perfectly the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. How would you like to be in that group? The group upon whom sudden destruction comes. The ones that are saying peace and safety, everything's okay, I'm just gonna lay down and go to sleep. It's gonna come upon them, sudden destruction, as travail upon a woman to a child. Another figure of speech. Simile, how does travail come upon a woman with a child? 
It's not a five minutes after she becomes pregnant. No, the, when the fullness of time comes, whether she's ready or not, that baby's coming. It doesn't matter whether the crib is furnished, whether the baby's room is painted or not, that baby is coming because it comes on just like that. Did she know it was coming? Oh yeah, she knew it was coming. But when it begins, that's how fast that travail starts. But you, brethren, but, contrasting conjunction, you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. We are supposed to be in a different group that is not destroyed, who is working, who is not asleep on the Temple Mount. We are supposed to be on duty for the King of Kings, for the high priest forever after the order of the Melchizedek, Yeshua, who gave us a job to do, and we are supposed to be, as it says in verse five, children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night. We are not of the darkness. So don't let us sleep as others but let us watch, guard, and be sober. They that sleep, sleep in the night. Those that are drunk, they drink in the night. But let us, who are of the day, who are of the light, let's be sober. Let's put on the breastplate of faith and love. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. See, it's not the helmet of salvation, the helmet is the hope of salvation. That's what guards our mind. That's what keeps us on track. That keeps us serving. That keeps us purifying ourselves as he is pure because we have that hope of salvation, of complete wholeness when Yeshua returns and changes our mortal bodies into immortality, who then changes that corrupted body which puts on incorruption in a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trump is when it happens, and the twinkle of an eye is how fast it happens, and that is how the day of the Lord is coming upon us. Because God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation, to obtain wholeness by our Lord, Yeshua Messiah, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, another figure of speech, whether we are living or in the grave dead, and why the euphemism sleep is used, because it's not a forever state, we will get up from that state. Whether we're alive or dead, we will live together with them. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another. There, there we are, we are going to comfort each other and strengthen each other because we are not asleep, we are are aware that he's coming and we are preparing because he is the one who is going to reward us for what we've done in this life.
Yeshua said that there were going to be many signs that would precede when he would come and rescue or save his people. And he told his disciples that the temple is going to be destroyed. This is just uh, to, to three disciples uh, that went with him over on the side of the Mount of Olives after he left the Pharisees, religious leaders on the Temple Mount, the 23rd chapter of Matthew, after he gave a blistering, an absolute blistering to the religious leaders, he told his disciples that there's not gonna be one stone left on top of another, the whole thing is coming down, and, and that in fact did come to pass. The only thing that is left there of the temple is nothing in Jerusalem. There's a retaining wall, the walls that built the retaining wall upon which the plaza was then built, and then the temple on top of the plaza. The retaining walls are still there. Some of them at the top are cast down. All the walls that were up on top of the Temple Mount were all destroyed, and they have been somewhat rebuilt since then. But the temple, there's not one stone left on top of another. And uh, we, we see that Yeshua's words did literally come to pass on that particular uh, issue. But telling his disciples that it was going to be destroyed, they wanted to know, as they asked him, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your, of your coming, your parousia, your personal presence, when you come back? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? And he started by saying, don't let anyone deceive you. Many are gonna come in my name. They say they represent me, yet they're gonna deceive many. And then he went right down a list of all these things that are going to take place. You're gonna hear wars, threats of wars, terrorism, all these things, earthquakes, and all these things are gonna come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, I'm kind of amused every time I hear people uh, saying, you know, how many earthquakes we're having all this. This is Yeshua saying, the end is not yet. This is a sign that the end is not here. And then it goes on saying what is going to transpire and that you're gonna be delivered up, you're gonna be hated and betrayed by each other, they are going to kill you. And then he says this gospel of the kingdom that he's preaching is gonna be preached in all the world. This is not the prosperity gospel, it's not the name and claim it, it's not the, you know, the, the nonsense that we've been given uh, Babylonian sun worship repackaged as churchianity by Rome and the daughters of Rome. You know, he says what he taught is gonna be taught in all the world. And that is what we are endeavoring to do, to teach what Yeshua taught instead of telling Jesus stories, okay? This is what Yeshua said must be done. And then he said, the end will come when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel. Let's, let's go to that verse right here in the 24th chapter of Matthew. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. Oh, we're gonna back up. No, I'll start there. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness on all nations. And then shall the end come, period? No. There is no punctuation in the original text at all. This is saying, this gospel of the kingdom that he preached, this gospel, the one I'm teaching you and I'm telling you to teach others what I'm teaching you, the one that you know you build, listen to these words and do it, it's like building your house on a rock, that gospel of the kingdom, not the nonsense they come up with in the future, but what I am teaching this shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. Then the end shall come when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet stand in the holy place. Go back, back to the book of Daniel. As it says, he that reads, let him understand. All you have to do is go back to the book of Daniel. The abomination of desolation is what begins the last three and a half years. The last time, times and a half a time. The last 1260 days. It's repeated over and over and over, giving us, that's when the talos comes, the end or the the talos, that is the beginning of the very end and Yeshua comes back as he says at the end of that time. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation take place, 
Then if you're in Judea, get into the mountains. If you're on the housetop, don't come down and grab a sleeping bag. If you're out in the field, don't run back to the house and grab a jacket. You better take off out of Jerusalem like a scalded dog and pray it's not on the Sabbath because public transportation is shut down. If you've ever tried to get around Jerusalem on the Sabbath day or been in Jerusalem, you know that you know you don't get uh, 800,000 people out of Dodge immediately if it's on the Sabbath. If it's in the wintertime, you better pray it's not in the wintertime because then is going to come great tribulation as there's not been from the beginning of time, no, nor ever shall be in Seth. Those days would be shortened. There should no flesh be saved. Mankind is gonna bring himself to the brink of destruction. And then he said what false prophets are gonna say. That, oh, they're gonna say, I've come back and then you have to go see me. I'm in the desert, you know, it says in King James, or Ramos, that I'm outside, you have to go to me. Don't go, it's not me. And then there will be say, those who say that I'm coming Tamion, I'm coming in secret, don't believe them. Because like the lightning rips the sky open from the east to the west, that's what it's gonna look like. Nobody's gonna be able to duplicate it because I'm going to send forth my angels with the sound of the trumpet and they are gonna be sent to the four corners of the earth and they are going to raise the dead. And that's when we'll all be changed at the last trump. And it's gonna happen a moment in the twinkle of an eye. So those who say that I'm coming back in secret, don't believe them. Those who say that I've already come back, don't go, because it isn't me. You said, don't let anyone deceive you. Yeshua said, don't let anyone deceive you. Do not listen to those who say they represent me and say I'm coming back in secret. No, he's coming back after the abomination of desolation. It's exactly what Shaul indicates. Now let's go back to where we were in Thessal Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, before we touch anything of 2 Thessalonians. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write into you, for you yourselves perfectly know that the day of Yahovah so comes as a thief in the night. As a thief in the night, just like the high priest would sneak up on the Temple Mount and inspect, and if the priest on duty was not doing his job, he, as a thief and I, would sneak up, light his garments on fire, and he was exposed as a slothful servant. That is how Yeshua is coming at. But it says, for when they, when they, when these sloths, when these people that are supposed to be doing their duty, when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction is gonna come upon by them, and it's gonna be as or like. Travail comes upon a woman with a child. They're not gonna escape, there's no way out of it. When it hits, they're not gonna be ready for it, and that's but travail and how it comes upon a woman with a child. Not like she doesn't know what's gonna happen, but if she's not prepared, it's gonna happen anyway. But you, brethren, you, brethren, he says, you're not in the darkness. That day is not gonna overtake you as a thief. We're in a different category. We're watchful. We are servants who are doing what the master has commanded us to do. He says we are all children of the light and children of the day. We're not of the night or darkness. We're not drunk. We're not asleep. We are going to watch. We're going to be sober. And we're going to put on the breastplate to guard our heart of faith and love. And for a helmet to guard our mind, the hope of salvation because one day that salvation, the captain of our salvation will appear and that is when we will literally, biblically be saved. No one is saved right now. You don't go to a crusade and get saved just in case this whole God thing is really true, which I've heard people say that. Yeah, we went to the Bill Graham crusade to get saved just in case this whole God thing is really true. No, that's, that, you missed the point, that is not salvation. You went over, you went up and did a repeat after me prayer with absolutely no faith. You did nothing. You did nothing. It's the hope of salvation because when Yeshua comes, the captain of salvation, that's when he rescues us, makes us whole, saves us. Because we do not know yet what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him and we will see him as he is. That's why we control ourselves. This is why we use the grace of God to empower us to do the impossible, to walk in the fullness and stature of Messiah, to obey him, and at least attempt to do 
greater things than he did. And because we're listening to him, we're following him, we're doing what he asks us to do because it is the Messiah in us, the hope of glory, the Messiah in us who wants to do what he did while he was here because he's still here. He is in you. And if you have the Torah written on your heart, now allow him to put his commandments on your heart the Torah is simple, as it says, as John said. The, the commandments are not grievous, they're not difficult, okay? I mean, these. The, the, this is like the easiest part here, the Torah, look how skinny this thing is. This is the Torah, skinny. The Nevi'im, the Ketuvim. Here are the epistles, look at the epistles. They're just about as big as the Torah. The Gospels and epistles is bigger than the Torah. It's not grievous, it's not difficult. There's nothing in here that's that hard. Just ask Zachariah, turn to the first chapter of Luke and read it sometime. Zachariah and Elisheva, they were Kohanim of the lineage of Aaron, and if any commandments applied to anyone, they applied to them, yet in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, they were absolutely blameless. It's not difficult. The Torah is the baseline. We're supposed to be up here, walking by the Spirit. We're not gonna be in violation of anything down here, okay? We don't need to be under this, no. This, this is the simple thing, we're supposed to be living on a higher plane. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by Yeshua. Not that we're, he's the one that's gonna save us, he's the one. He has not appointed us to wrath, and that's why the last trumpet in the book of Revelation, the angel shouts out, now has come the time of the dead when the righteous are raised and rewarded, his servants of prophets, small and great, are raised and rewarded, and he will now destroy those destroyers of the earth. And then, right after that last trumpet, we're gathered together, and then what happens? The seven bowls of God's wrath poured out upon the earth. We are saved from the wrath to come. We have not been appointed that we have to go through the wrath of the Almighty, go through the wrath of man, go through the wrath of the government, go through the wrath of Satan, absolutely. No one's gotten out of it yet. She would said, you wanna follow me? Grab an execution stake and get in line. They're gonna kill me, they're gonna come after you, if you follow me. If you follow your own made-up Jesus, don't worry, they're not gonna come after you, you're just part of the problem. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.